Kellyanne, a, a report in the Washington Post says that President-elect Trump has only received two classified intelligence briefings since his election, and he's turned down many daily opportunities for briefings. Is this true? Has he turned down the opportunity to get classified intelligence briefings? So he is receiving classified intelligence briefings, and the president-elect is also receiving information uh, through his personal and on-the-phone meetings with over what's now 41 world leaders, uh, in addition to meeting with 60 men and women who could serve in his government but are certainly without the promise of any formal but, position or certainly offering their advice. But Kellyanne, has he turned advice. down uh, classified uh, briefings? I, I really I can't discuss that publicly. What I can tell you is that he is the most engaged individual I've ever met and brilliant to boot. And, and he is certainly um, availing himself of the information that is provided to him from a number of sources, including those intelligence briefings. We understand and we know just in recent history, President Obama, uh, President George W. Bush, they all, when they as soon as they could, received daily intelligence briefings to immerse themselves in national security matters that they weren't aware of because they hadn't been commander in chief yet, especially given the fact that President like Trump has no experience in government or the military. Shouldn't he also be getting them every day as it is allowed to, to be? Then I assure you, President elect Trump and Vice President elect Pence are receiving a steady stream of information, including intelligence that will further prepare them to be the number one and number two leaders of this country. Uh, okay. Uh, it all started with this moment a year ago when this New Hampshire student stood up in front of Donald Trump at a forum and said this. I want to get paid the same as a man, and I think you understand that. So if you become president, will a woman make the same as a man, and do I get to choose what I do with my body? You're going to make the same if you do as good a job. You're going to make the same if you do as good a job, and I happen to be pro-life. All right, so after that exchange, the very next morning, then-candidate Trump tweeted, the arrogant young woman who questioned me in such a nasty fashion and no labels yesterday was a jab staffer. How can he beat Russia and China? Well, what followed for the student was months of bullying and harassment by Trump supporters and beyond. Uh, she is now a year later speaking out on TV for the very first time. She joins me now. She is Lauren Batchelder. Lauren, thank you so much for, for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. So I know a year later there has been some positivity, but I mean, what was the ugliest of the ugly you, you heard online? I think the worst day was when someone said my address and they said they were coming and they were going to rape me. I mean, I never expected that that would ever happen. Wow, just taking a minute to take that in. Um, and so yeah. did, did you, how did that make you feel? It made me really angry because to me, they were just trying to objectify me. Um, so what I did is I decided that I was going to prove them wrong. I joined rugby. Um, I decided I was going to graduate in three years and made me angry. One year ago this month, Donald Trump called climate change a scam designed to make a lot of people a lot of money. Now his choice to be the director of the EPA, Oklahoma Attorney General Scott Pruitt, has said the debate over climate change is far from settled, making environmentalists concerned about how much the pending head of the Environmental Protection Agency actually wants to, you know, protect the environment. This is all a nightmare in particular for our next guest who quit his day job managing a billion dollar investment firm to take up the fight against climate change full time. Joining us now, philanthropist and environmentalist Tom Steyer. Mr. Steyer, thank you so much for joining us as always. Jake, thanks for having me. So what do you think of Scott Pruitt? Well, I think that Donald Trump has chosen someone to head the EPA who's been one of the leading opponents of the EPA. And I think that he's someone who's very close to corporate interests and specifically oil interests. In fact, one of the biggest independent oil men in the United States of America, Harold Hamm, was the head of his election committee. So I think we can see exactly where the president-elect is going on this. He's appointing people to dismantle the agencies that they're scheduled to lead, to take their mission and flush it. There are also reports that Congresswoman Kathy McMorris-Rogers may be nominated to head the Department of, of the Interior. I don't know what you think about her. Is she trying to dismantle the Department of Interior, you think? 
Well, she's someone who's been active in supporting drill, you know, drilling off the coast. She's someone who has said about Al Gore that she'd give him an A for creative writing, but an F for science. So I think that she's very consistent with the rest of the president-elect's picks in the sense that they're climate deniers who are absolutely opening up America to corporate interests at the expense of the American citizens. Well, let's talk about the election. There may have never been two major party candidates with more divergent views on the environment in the history of our, our country. You supported Clinton. Uh, Donald Trump has suggested climate change is a Chinese hoax. How do you interpret these election results? Uh, the, the guy that you opposed with lots of money and lots of effort he won. Donald Trump is proposing something in terms of returning to a fossil fuel driven economy that was successful and the dominant idea in the 1950s. So his goal is to return to a technology that was good 65 years ago and think that's going to lead us into the future. The fact of the matter is we actually Jake came out with a report two days ago showing that if we move to clean energy, it will create more jobs in America that there'll be better paying jobs, that the America will grow faster and our costs will go down dramatically. So he's got an old technology that he's trying to push to please corporate interests at the expense of American working people and American citizens. Well, with all due respect, a lot of working people just don't believe that argument. Take a listen to Hillary Clinton speaking in Ohio at a town hall in March. I'm the only candidate which has a policy about how to bring economic opportunity using clean renewable energy as the key into coal country. Because we're going to put a lot of coal miners and coal companies out of business, right? And she was talking about trying to bring new jobs, these clean energy jobs you're talking about, to coal country. But that comment hurt her in states that matter, such as Ohio. Is there a more effective way to talk about these issues, or is the policy the problem? Oh, good grief. I think the fact of the matter is people who work in the coal industry do it to support their families. They started in it for the most part when it was a vibrant industry. It's shrunk dramatically since then. And I think that the idea of not caring about working Americans in declining industries is something that is a huge mistake. The fact of the matter is in Ohio, there are probably 25 times more jobs in clean energy than there are in coal. So we absolutely should be caring about working Americans who work in coal. We should absolutely care about parts of the country that are having economic problems, that are having problems growing and providing good paying jobs. But the fact of the matter is, the numbers say that there are 60,000 coal miners in the whole of the United States. And in my home state, of California, there are probably 550,000 clean energy jobs right now, 10 times the number of coal miners in the whole United States. So when we look forward, it is really important that we go area by area and show people what the actual jobs will be. And we should never take any pride in the fact that new technologies are going to replace old technologies, because there are people who are working those old technologies, are hardworking Americans, trying to support their families, trying to do it with dignity. And the fact of the matter is the world is moving on and we need as a society to take care of working people who have done very poorly over the last 35 years in the United States of America. Tom Steyer, thank you so much. At one point, Rudy Giuliani was a front runner for this position, and a lot of that was based on the fact that he made no secret of wanting this job, but also that he was very loyal to Trump, Donald Trump very early on. Now, he was just on television sort of explaining why he says he pulled his name out of the running. Let's take a listen to that. My desire to be in the cabinet was great, but it wasn't that great. And he had a lot of terrific candidates. And I thought I could play a better role being on the outside and continuing to be his close friend and advisor. That's sort of the role I played during the campaign. I never worked for the campaign. I was never part of it. it gave me a certain degree of independence uh, in being able to give advice. And I saw that he had so many good candidates available. I mean, there was no reason to complicate his life any longer. So I withdrew uh, back on the 29th. 
Now, he says he withdrew his name. That's not what we're hearing from sources. Sources say that he was informed he would not be getting the Secretary of State position. And behind the scenes, they had sort of been trying to urge him to accept maybe one of these other slots in the national security and defense arena. And Giuliani had made it very clear it was Secretary of State that, that that's what he wanted. Now, we reported at the top of the show that transition sources told us that Rudy Giuliani was no longer under consideration to be President-elect Trump's Secretary of State, and now the transition has put out a statement saying that Giuliani removed his name from consideration for any position in the Trump administration. Trump, in the statement, praised Giuliani and said he would have been an outstanding, outstanding member of the cabinet in several roles, but respects his decision to remain in the private sector. Curious. For more, let's bring in our political panel. We have with us Washington Bureau Chief for USA Today, Susan Page, Associate Editor and Columnist for Real Clear Politics, A.B. Stoddard, and CNN contributor Selena Zito. Thanks one and all for being here. Susan, let me start with you. Translate that for us. What happened here? Well, you know, uh, Rudy Giuliani said he only wanted Secretary of State, no other job. He apparently meant it. Became clear he was not going to get the Secretary of State job. This statement being put out today gives him some face saving because it says he told Trump on November 29th that he wasn't interested in joining the administration. And so this makes it look a little less like he didn't, just wasn't able to get the job that he sought. And that some people thought he had a good shot at getting, given all his work for Trump during the campaign. He was a stalwart, but I have to say, I had been hearing that he would have potentially confirmation problems on Capitol Hill because of all his uh, business entanglements all over the world. Even the Rudy fans among uh, Trump's closest supporters who wanted him to have the job worried he couldn't be vetted and make it through confirmation with all those entanglements with um, overseas business dealings. The same kind of things that they, that Donald Trump you know, criticize Hillary Clinton for in the campaign. It just would have been a very difficult thicket for him. But it's interesting that if he's really been out of the running since November 29th, why have Trump surrogates come out and still used his name in the ever-expanding list when they've talked about it in the weeks and days since? It's so strange. And, and uh, Selena, I guess people, a guy like Rudy Giuliani, he's an accomplished man, a mayor, uh, he, can, he can want what he wants. But, uh, you know, I have been told that, you know, the Trump team offered him attorney general, he right, didn't want right. it, offered him homeland security, he didn't want it. Uh, you know, I guess he had his sights set on the secretary of state position. Right. I think the last time we saw him was right around November 30th, 29th, 28th, somewhere around there. He had his last public appearance. He was asked about being attorney general, and he said, no, that's Jeff Sessions. And uh, he said, you know, the only thing I really want is, you know, secretary of state. And then he just went radio silent. We haven't heard from him since. You know, the irony would be if one of his biggest defenders, Trump's biggest defenders during the campaign, does not get that job, and his biggest critic, yes. Mitt Romney, yeah, right. does. That would be that would be interesting. Do you think that Mitt Romney actually still is in the in the hunt here? I think we know from Donald Trump that Mitt Romney is still in the mix. Although the fact that Donald Trump hasn't made an appointment yet indicates that he's still looking around a little. Uh, but I, I think we I think we know pretty with some degree of certainty that Romney is at least in the mix. So let's talk about the fact that uh, the Washington Post is reporting that Trump has picked the president and COO of Goldman Sachs as his National Economic Council director. His pick for Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin worked at Goldman for almost two decades. Obviously, senior strategist Steve Bannon also worked at Goldman Sachs. Listen to then candidate Trump talking about Ted Cruz, vowing that he would still take on Goldman Sachs even after taking a loan from them. So the nice part about me is that I don't have any of that stuff. I don't have it. I'm putting up my own. I'm not, I'm not into Goldman Sachs. I don't care about Goldman Sachs. There was a lot of stuff about Goldman Sachs having to do with Ted Cruz and then later on uh, Hillary Clinton. Selena, you, you uh, really know Trump supporters very well. You've been covering them uh, very well for, for months and months and months. Do they care? Can Donald Trump flip-flop on the Goldman Sachs issue and, and, and upset them? Yeah, I, I, there, there's very little that he can't flip-flop on. And, and you have to get inside the mind of the Trump voter. It wasn't always what he said, but it was how he said it, and it was because he was not a politician. And, and they trust him at this moment. I mean, there, there, there's this sort of, you know, honeymoon period to be able to, you know, to... to Pick whoever he wants because they just trust his decision making at this point. He was so anti Goldman Sachs, and in his last commercial, he actually yeah. had an image of Lloyd Blankfein, uh, right. the CEO of Goldman Sachs, as a as an international cabal boogeyman. Well, you know, all roads lead back to Goldman Sachs, and no, none of us are surprised. 
Um, but really, if you think about the voters uh, who supported Trump, who would be bothered by that or went to Bernie Sanders rallies and somehow brought themselves around to to support Donald Trump, they're going to be disappointed um, if it if, in a continuum. What will happen with Trump is he'll get an excuse here and there and he'll flip flop here and there. And if it looks real swampy in a year, including his own business arrangements, um, then it could suddenly turn on him and people could say, this is exactly the kind of system we've always had. Right. It was just a new face pretending to have a new system. But this, this could pile up and become um, an obvious criticism later on that you always, in the end, are supporting people from Goldman Sachs and giving them good jobs and influence. In, in, at the highest levels of government. We've been talking a lot about uh, Trump's cabinet. Um, Tom Steyer was very critical uh, of a couple potential uh, uh, picks there. Do you sense any confirmation problems for any of his picks so far, Susan? Yeah, I think some of them will have problems because there is a vetting process. You don't just name someone to the cabinet. There's an investigative process that goes on that includes Democrats in the Senate as well as Republicans. And some of these figures have never served in public office before. They've never gone through this process before. I think always we find with the new administration somebody who has a problem we didn't expect and it's very, it turns out to be very daunting. Just think about Tom Daschle. Who would have guessed that Tom Daschle would not have been able to take the job he wanted to take at the beginning of the Obama administration because of something came out through vetting, but that happened. And I broke that story and I'll just tell you one of the things that it was, the reason he was in trouble was because he had not paid the taxes for this free driver that he got from a rich friend. And this is a whole cabinet full of rich guys and, yeah. and gals who I'm sure have lots of favors in, yeah. in there. I mean, there's there's a potential of something like that happening very, very easily. And 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 I don't, this is one of those instances where if, if those kinds of things come out, Trump voters are not going to like that. They they don't want someone that way. If this person can be someone that can that can lead the government or can lead the Treasury and, and you know, help create jobs, that's fine. But if they're someone who has this sort of entitled and, and or skirts the law just the way they perceive that the Clintons did, then Trump has a problem with his picks. All right, we'll see what happens to be continued. A.B., Susan, Selena, thank you so much. Have a great weekend to all of you. Uh, Rudy Giuliani said he only wanted Secretary of State no other job. He apparently meant it. became clear he was not going to get the Secretary of State job. This statement being put out today gives him some face saving because it says he told Trump on November 29th that he wasn't interested in joining the administration. And so this makes it look a little less like he didn't, just wasn't able to get the job that he sought. And that some people thought he had a good shot at getting, given all his work for Trump during the campaign. He was a stalwart, but I have to say, I had been hearing that he would have potentially confirmation problems on Capitol Hill because of all his uh, business entanglements all over the world. Even the Rudy fans among clo uh, Trump's closest supporters who wanted him to have the job worried he couldn't be vetted and make it through confirmation with all those entanglements with um, overseas business dealings. The same kind of things that they, that Donald Trump, you know, criticized Hillary Clinton for in the campaign. It just would have been a very difficult thicket for him. But it's interesting that if he's really been out of the running since November 29th, why have Trump surrogates come out and still used his name in the ever-expanding list when they've talked about it? in the weeks and days since. It's so strange. And, and uh, Selena, I guess people, a guy like Rudy Giuliani, he's an accomplished man, a mayor, uh, he, can, he can want what he wants. But, uh, you know, I had been told that, you know, the Trump team offered him attorney general. He right, didn't want right. it. Offered him homeland security. He didn't want it. Uh, you know, I guess... He had his sights set on the Secretary of State position. Right. I think the last time we saw him was right around November 30th, 29th, 28th, somewhere around there. He had his last public appearance. He was asked about being Attorney General, and he said, no, that's Jeff Sessions. And uh, he said, you know, the only thing I really want is, you know, Secretary of State. And then he just went radio silent. We haven't heard from him since You then. know, the irony would be if one of his biggest defenders, Trump's biggest defenders during the campaign, does not get that job, and his biggest critic, yes. Mitt yeah, Romney, right. does. For this evening, President-elect Donald Trump will hold his fourth thank you rally. Tonight, Trump hits the stage in Grand Rapids, Michigan, a state he turned red, something every Republican presidential nominee had failed to do since George H.W. Bush won there in 1988. Trump is on the road already. He's in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He just wrapped up a Go vote rally for the Republican Senate candidate there named John Kennedy. President-elect Trump continues to fill his cabinet. Meanwhile, he has apparently not yet decided who will be his secretary of state. But transition sources tell CNN he has decided it will not be 
Rudy Giuliani. The former New York City mayor was told earlier this week that he's out, according to sources. We're also being told that Trump is looking even more closely at ExxonMobil CEO Rex Tillerson for the position. Tillerson has publicly spoken out against sanctioning Russia. He has known President Vladimir Putin dating back to the 1990s when Tillerson headed up Exxon's branch in Russia. And just in case you think President-elect Trump has been insufficiently ubiquitous, we now know that he will continue to be the executive producer of the reality show he left when, his, when he started his campaign. CNN's Sarah Murray joins me now here in Washington. Sarah, explain to me how this is going to work. The trans transition team, uh, they're saying that uh, his being executive producer of Celebrity Apprentice, it's, it's just going to be something of a hobby? I think we're all dying to know exactly how this is going to work out. Obviously, it's not normal for a president to have a side gig, but Donald Trump is not your normal president-elect, and sources are telling CNN exactly that, that even though Donald Trump made a big fuss over the fact that it wasn't his business interests that mattered to him, it was the presidential campaign, it was becoming president, he doesn't look like he wants to leave those behind anytime soon. On the campaign trail, Donald Trump easily shrugged aside his business interests, insisting the allure of the White House was far more important. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. It's nice when you don't have to care, but I don't care. What I care about is making America great again. That's much more important. It's much more important. But now the president-elect is showing little sign of stepping back from his corporate calling. And yet another potential conflict of interest, sources say Trump will remain an executive producer for NBC's Celebrity Apprentice, even as he serves as president of the United States. Trump hosted 14 seasons of The Apprentice, but in 2015, NBC said it was cutting ties with Trump after his controversial remarks about undocumented Mexican immigrants. I have a big chunk of that show, and I could have done it for another five years if I wanted to. Uh, but I don't know. There's a lot of pressure on Arnold, because Arnold's going to have a hard time. You know, it was the number one show, and I did it for 14 seasons. I have a big stake in it. Now one of Trump's top advisors, Kellyanne Conway, is defending Trump's decision, saying he'll remain involved in the show in his free time. Were we so concerned about the hours and hours and hours spent on the golf course of the current president? I mean, presidents have a right to do things uh, in their in their spare time or their leisure time. Of course, Trump and other Republicans were sharply critical of the time President Obama spent on the links. And he gets on this plane, flies to Hawaii. He's there for a long time. Golf, 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 more, more. Learning how to chip, learning how to hit the drive, learning how to putt, oh, I want more. The latest news on Trump's business dealings comes days before he's slated to hold a press conference on who will run his company once he heads to the White House, although there's little indication Trump will fully divest from his business. But in the meantime, the battle for Secretary of State rages on. CNN has learned ExxonMobil CEO Rex Tillerson's affair. stock is on the rise for the post, but one-time frontrunner Rudy Giuliani appears to be out of contention. And Trump is using his thank you tour to defend the cabinet picks he's already made, which include a number of business titans with little government experience. By the way, some of the people I put on to negotiate, you've been noticing, are some of the most successful people in the world. And one newspaper criticized me. Why can't they have people of modest means? Because I want people that made a fortune. Because now they're negotiating with you. Okay? That road show continues today with an evening rally in Michigan, as well as a stop in Louisiana to campaign for a Republican Senate candidate. But before he left Trump Tower, he squeezed in a meeting with House Speaker Paul Ryan, who's putting aside his past criticism of Trump in favor of a show of unity instead. We're very excited about getting to work and hitting the ground running in 2017 to put this country back on track. Now, we've paid a lot of attention to the battle over Secretary of State, but there's been another one brewing about who is going to lead the Republican National Committee now that Reince Priebus is going into the White House. And we are expecting Donald Trump to make it official tonight and to throw his support behind Ronna Romney McDaniel. She's the head of the Michigan Republican Party, with the caveat that nothing is set until it comes out of Donald Trump's mouth. And, of course, RNC committee members would have to vote on the pick, but uh, the, the backing of the president-elect holds an awful lot of weight for that. Sure job. does. Interesting because there was talk that Governor Chris Christie might be considered for that position. Yeah, there was talk before things went a little bit south, I think, in the relationship between Chris Christie and Donald Trump. All right, Sarah Murray, thank you so much. Donald Trump's pick for Labor Secretary, not without a side of controversy. Andy Putzer is the CEO of Hardee's and Corals Jr., the company responsible for racy ads like these.
I don't think there's anything wrong with a beautiful woman in a bikini eating a burger and washing a, a, a Bentley or a, a pickup truck or being in a hot tub. I think there's probably nothing more American. And while Puster does have experience running a company like Trump, he has no prior experience in government. I think it would be you know, the most fun you could have with your clothes on to be in this cabinet and get things going. Puzder holds some views that conflict with the department's current mission on the minimum wage. I've been opposed to a minimum wage increases that kill jobs, and a lot of these state increases are to that level where they would kill jobs. I think that's bad for American workers. Puzder argued that businesses may turn to automation to cut labor costs, saying machines are, quote, always polite and never take a vacation. Trump allies are praising the pick today. Nobody can deny this man is in touch with uh, how to create jobs, the importance of labor and management yeah. roles and responsibilities. I think he's a, he's a great choice. But the labor community is voicing concerns. And he's filled his administration uh, with nominees who are millionaires, multimillionaires, and billionaires, and appointed the most anti-worker Secretary of Labor uh, on in modern history. One key to Donald Trump's win was his appeal to blue-collar workers with promises to keep jobs in America. My administration will follow two simple rules. Buy American and hire American. Poster writing last year, businesses create jobs labor unions do not. To the contrary, labor unions often discourage businesses from creating jobs, particularly entry-level ones, by increasing the cost of labor without increasing its value. This after Trump's recent Twitter takedown of carrier union boss Chuck Jones, who said that Trump exaggerated the number of jobs he saved. He didn't tell the truth. Uh, he inflated the numbers, and uh, I called him out on it. Prompting organized labor leaders to come to Jones's defense, including the head of the United Steelworkers on out front. I really thought that uh, that wasn't a role for President elect Trump to go after Chuck Jones. It's a telling 2013 photo of the most senior Marine Corps generals at the time. Three of them who fought in Iraq, now set to become Donald Trump's inner circle on national security. Now retired General James Mattis, nominated to be Secretary of Defense. Retired General John Kelly, nominated for Homeland Security Secretary. And General Joseph Dunford, the current Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. All three achieved the rare rank of four-star general, the first time there have ever been that many in the Corps. Dunford's making clear he's not worried about Mattis taking the top civilian job so soon after retirement. Do I have any concerns? No. <laughs> Nobody can yet say how these four stars will deal with the controversial National Security Advisor, retired three-star Army Lieutenant General Mike Flynn, who was junior to them. These Marines have personal bonds that are as deep as can be. On November 9, 2010, Dunford broke the news to Kelly. His son, Robert Kelly, had been killed in Afghanistan. A brotherhood of battle-hardened senior Marines forged back in 2003 when Mattis commanded the 1st Marine Division and Dunford and Kelly served under him. It was a war their new commander-in-chief, Donald Trump, opposed. Behind you, behind you, behind CNN's you. Martin Savage was embedded with the Marines at the time. What I remember most is how hard it was. Hard in many, many ways. Uh, the leadership that this unit had expected great things. Mattis expected great things. Kelly expected great things. And it wasn't just that they were projecting great plans. They projected that feeling all the way down to the average Marine. Mattis's division fought in the initial high-speed attack. From Kuwait to Baghdad and beyond, it would become the longest ground march in Corps history. But it was a war that saw Marines struggle in western Iraq, spending months fighting an insurgency in Fallujah. Eventually, more than 4,000 U.S. troops killed, more than 30,000 wounded. 
Well, we have some breaking news on the Trump transition. Rudy Giuliani is out of consideration for an administration position. We're going to hear from the former mayor in a few minutes. But first, this news comes on a very busy day for President-elect Donald Trump. Mr. Trump starting off his morning with a face-to-face -face meeting with House Speaker Paul Ryan at Trump Tower, followed by a get-out-the-vote event in Baton Rouge. And now Mr. Trump is headed to Grand Rapids, Michigan, for the next stop on his thank you tour, kicking off in about a couple hours from now. One common theme in the president-elect speeches, his plan to bring jobs back to America. He doubled down on his promise during a speech in Louisiana this afternoon. Take a listen. It's time to get help for the American people. We're going to get them into the labor market, and they're going to do a great job, and they're going to make good money. We're going to rebuild our country with American hands by American workers. My administration will follow two simple rules, buy American and hire American, okay? We have so many companies right now, although I think probably if I would have said a couple of months ago, we have so many companies negotiating to leave, I don't think they're negotiating so fast right now. All right, KG, yeah, he promised to bring, make America great again by bringing jobs back to America and keeping American jobs in America. Seems to be keeping his promise. Yeah, I love it. And also a perfect uh, location and venue to make this kind of speech to connect with the people, the forgotten men and women, the working class people that wanted someone to hear them and put them back to work and put money in their pockets and food on their table and American cars made by American hands on the streets across this country. I think it's fantastic. This is why people joined his movement and carried him into the White House to try to get this done. And perfect timing as well. Well, of course, with the lawsuit now being dropped for the recount here as well. So yeah, and, fantastic. and also there's a there's a um, an election tomorrow. That, that last Senate seat's uh, up for grabs tomorrow. Uh, one early this morning, Andy Putzer was named or at least tapped to run the Labor Department. Guys got 75,000 people working for him. Seems to me a logical, wise choice to run labor. So no problem with the ladies in bikinis selling hamburgers. No, you have no problem with this. Wait, so, so you're talking <laughs> about the Carl's Jr. commercials. Carl's yeah, Jr. I, I a, see a lot of the is, feminists. Is, is, is one of the re restaurant yeah, franchises. They're, they're not they happy. happy. So that the real argument is that this is a guy who at a time of populist anger about income inequality is opposed to raising the minimum wage, also opposed to the idea that more Americans should be made eligible to receive overtime pay uh, and, and, and wants to do away with that Obama era regulation. Can, can I just check you on that one? Please, go right ahead. Andy Putzer supports President Trump, President like Trump's minimum wage raises that are, quote, rational and do not destroy <laughs> jobs or the businesses supporting them. Well, I think the difference is that he's a job creator, not a job killer, and that he realizes that changing the federal minimum wage is putting a mandate on employers that doesn't necessarily make sense. I mean, saying that he isn't in favor of labor is like saying that a general doesn't love his troops. I mean, he's mm -hmm. a guy that goes out there and expands business, builds it bigger. He understands what makes it tick. He's highly dependent on labor. I think he loves the guys that work for him, and he's a great choice. He understands exactly how business works and how to expand it. Are you talking about Andy Puzder? <laughs> yes. The guy that said that if he had his way, he would automate his entire company because robots don't need health care, robots don't sue, robots don't do the, the, the slip and pay or whatever you call it. Slip they don't and need fall. slip and fall. You're the lawyer. Uh, he, 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 I've tried it on you, and it never works. Right. He employed 75,000 people, but on the whole, he would rather employ none. Yeah. And by the way, I think it's a great choice. I think Puzzler's a smart guy. I think he's smart on minimum wage. I think he's smart on overtime. But he's also smart on the realities of automation. Who wants to automate? Yeah. I mean, who does it? So no, you but that's like my point. Automation so, is great. But, so you're kind of talking so you're out of both no sides here. At all. Well, no, I'm not. I, you have to have automation in a business. He yeah. wants to keep the employers that the employees that They're he has. They're going away though. It's fast Productive, food. Productive, efficient. Fast food. Yeah, but, but, I mean, but, you can't but, stop time. Guys, I mean, yeah. they, they, that's my point. You can't. Uh, but uh, what if you decided to punish time or punish progress right, or the but, tariffs? But he's also the guy who is is in favor of, of Donald Trump, President like Donald Trump's border policy as well. That's where good. there are a lot of illegal immigrants who are taking these fast food jobs yeah. that m Americans could be taking. He he promises to uh, implement. And it, it, the agenda. That's, I think that's a Trump's relatively agenda. new thing for Puzzler. I think Puzzler was was definitely into cheap labor up until recently. Well, so I would not go back and look. Cheap labor. I mean, no, no, I think no. he was for open borders. Sure. He was and let me just say, for, let me just say for all of our talk illegal, at this though. table, and I'm worried about your job at the moment, yes. given your position here. But I, <laughs> but I, just, I'm I think let's let's ask labor. Let's ask the people who run the AFL-CIO. 
They say this man fights workers. Yes. This man is hell on workers. Juan, you, ca you call labor, big picture labor, the 11 million people who are in unions? That's who you call hey, labor? FLCI, you How don't about think the other 130 in million Americans who are working who aren't unionized, who are, are, are against everything union? Against everything? Against everything union. I don't union. think that's true. I think what you're saying is true is there are fewer and fewer Americans who are in unions from they're the not private effective. sector. Yeah, the unions not today effective. are mostly it's public million. sector. We have but 153 has, million workforce. Look, because at the, look, wages have been going down. People are struggling at right. times for jobs, labor even with an unemployment rate low. Job. But what I'm telling you is big labor is not stupid. But this is like the attack on Chuck Jones the other day by Trump. Big labor is stupid. Big they're, labor they're pricing yeah. themselves out of the market. They are. But oh, because, exactly but you know what the thing is. Is. because they're greedy. And yeah, and when you're in a party pig like that, but you know what? It, the, I'm, I'm, the choice of puzzler is t telling you what the future is. The yes. future is automation. Yep. So all this stuff about saving a thousand jobs here and a thousand jobs there, it's not going to stop automation, robots, artificial no. intelligence. Okay. Can I it's tell you not. what the difference is though? It, it, the automated factory is going to stay here because right. when it comes down to where they want to have their factory, I, I mean, of course, CEOs would rather have it here. They can keep a closer eye on production. They know that the workers that are there mm -hmm. are more efficient, are better. They need lower cost of regulation, lower taxes, cheaper energy because we're drill, 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 and they'd rather have the factory here. Yes, the factory is going to have fewer workers, right. but you need some workers those to run alongside but those, but robots. those are higher paying jobs. But yeah. it'd be better than having the factories in China where they can't keep an eye on it and where a bunch of products are so much leaking. So you would, you would say it's okay to apply tariffs to a company to keep them from going to China? No, I think that's his opening salvo in the negotiation. I think he's mm -hmm. saying we're going to throw this tariff on, and I think that that's how you reset the negotiation. I don't believe it would ever come to that or he would actually do that, but it's got yeah. Look like it's going to. Don't tell anyone in these factories <laughs> that he's not going to actually do that. But and, I don't and, think and he the is. And the carrier deal that was a a threat. But I'm not sure that they stayed or these jobs, the 800 jobs, stayed because of that threat. I think it was because it was a good deal to stay tax-wise. Yeah. They got tax breaks. They got incentives. They got investment. Um, and it, it, what, it, did it, Sarah, and what did Sarah, got what did Sarah Palin uh, call it? Crony capitalism. And she was what, what did George Will say? Socialism. I would say <laughs> George Will is completely off his game. Oh, I, I think. Oh, well, why? With, you can't with say that, that. He's right. Because He's if, talking if about conservative free market principles. Thank conservative you. free market principles say if you lower taxes, more corporations will going to yes. hire more people. But then right. you don't need coercion to go along that. You're saying lower taxes that's a, that's as, the as the carrot Brett, for the he stick. Never, he of, hasn't of coerced tariffs. anyone. He's not even president. He I can't coerce anyone okay, at all. Okay, so he never brought up 35% tariffs. He brought it up, but he didn't coerce. What he did do that's was a secure threat. 16... You even said it was a threat. Greg, he secured millions of dollars of tax incentives. That is what... Secured millions of hold dollars on, of hold free on, money guys. from the state no, of Indiana. Mike, in the, who's it's the, who's the governor of Indiana? It's Mike, Pence. Mike Pence is. Mike secured the, the, yeah, the but, million but, dollars but, of, of but, tax uh, incentives. Why would what, why would the next guy say give me some? Of course incentives. they should, so and hopefully is, they get it. This is not a system, an Do economic this. system. This is this a great is, idea, Eric. This is what they call picking winners and losers. No, it's oh, not. Why are you against companies keeping their own money? It's not taxpayer money. It's carriers' money. It's their profits that they Well, then they don't need Indiana's money. Money. Yeah, they don't. It's why not Indiana's money. Why are they asking Indiana's for Indiana's money? money? It's money. their money. They earn right. profits. They're giving less of it to the government. Okay, yep. Business yep. 101 during the break. Let's okay. do Rudy. Let's do this.